Here we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about negotiation mastery. Um, and the first thing I like to start with is you already know a lot. You wouldn't be in this room if you didn't know a lot about negotiations already. I want to recognize that and respect it. Because I know that probably a lot of people have seen this book, Getting to Yes. Right, so a lot of people, anybody read this book, Getting to Yes? It's a famous, I got a few hands. Of course, if you read Getting to Yes, the next book has to be Getting Past No. A lot of people have read the book Value Selling. And then, of course, you need something that's beyond value selling. And, of course, you've read The Negotiation Genius and also put in Negotiating for Dummies. Now, the only two books you should be reading, of course, are the two books that we've written, but that's a different story. What do I want to do today? When you're working with adults, the important thing is to remind them of things they may already know in a way they'll never forget. Reminding them things that they may already know in a way they'll never forget. There's a big gap between knowing and doing. And I think a lot of people in this room know. Here's the goal. Can we teach a few things today that puts it in your toolbox so you don't only know it, you do it? I like to use an analogy for this. Uh, anybody here ever been skydiving? Anybody ever jumped that? How many times? Just once, right. That was me too, just once. Uh, <laughs> when I was younger, I used to belong to a group of friends. We called ourselves the Point Break Club. We did all the adrenaline rush things. We jumped out of airplanes. We swam with sharks. We went whitewater rafting. We did bungee jumping. We're still together, but it's more like bowling and car. It just changes over time. But back in the day, we were pretty adventurous, I got to tell you. And one time we went skydiving. And the interesting thing about skydiving was we went there at 6 in the morning. And from 6 a.m. to noon, basically, they taught you everything you needed to know. Right? You went and you went from 6 a.m. to noon. And they only taught you like five things. How to get on the wing of the plane and let go. Very important. Uh, how to arch your back to maintain an aerodynamic so you weren't spinning around like this up in the air. How to pull your ripcord so that you could actually maintain that aerodynamic. Right? How to basically, if your lines got tangled, how to get them untangled, and then they taught you how to land. Five things. We practice them over and over and over again. Right, I get it. Pull my ripcord. Right? Maintain my aerodynamic. Pull my ripcord. Pull my ripcord. They actually had this, um, they had this hanger, and you'd be suspended from the hanger like you were in your parachute, and they'd spin you around, and they'd say, if your white lines ever get tangled, grab a hold of the blue straps and kick like a bicycle. And when you kick like a bicycle, basically what happens is you start to spin around in the air and your lines get untangled. So you're in this hangar and they're spinning you around. Kick like a bicycle, kick like a bicycle, kick like a bicycle. I'm like, I get it. They're, nope, you'll do it again. Kick like a bicycle. Finally, it was time to jump. Now, we didn't have one of those planes that was like big and everybody's like running out one after another. You know, we had this like little prop plane. My friend Brad had arranged the entire trip. He's the first one to go up. He gets into this little prop plane. He gets to 10,000 feet. He jumps out and he's a little dot in the sky. We're on the ground. We're like, yeah, this is going to be great. I can't wait. And he goes 10,000, 8,000, 4,000. Get to 4,000 feet. He pulls his rip cord. His chute opens up. Everything's going perfect. And what happens is you, know, we, you have somebody, you have this on, on, your, on your vest, you have a walkie-talkie. And there's someone on the ground talking you down, right? You know, steer left, steer right. And then for basically the most important command, put on the brakes for when you land. The guy talking us down was Gus. Gus was on the walkie-talkie. Gus was like 99 years old, right? Flew with the Wright brothers, I'm, I'm convinced, right? And he's talking down. He's like, Shh, you're looking good, Brad. You're fine. Yep, a little left. You're looking good. You're looking good. Bam! Brad hits the ground at like 40 miles an hour. Gus never told him to put on his brakes. Brad stands up, <laughs> Brad falls down. He's got a spiral fracture from his ankle all the way up to his knee. As the ambulance pulls away, Gus goes, okay, which one of you guys is next? <laughs> oh! And we said, could we, could we practice that landing thing one more time? <laughs> well, I was the very last one to go. We still all went, and every single person had a problem. One guy jammed his ankle, another guy missed a drop zone, one guy blacked out as he was coming out of the plane. As I'm walking up to put on my parachute, I hear two young instructors talking, and one says to the other, get Gus off the walkie-talkie. He's killing these guys. <laughs> 
put on my parachute, I'm walking up to the plane, and the one young instructor puts his arm around me and says, Mark, I'll be talking to you down. I'll be on the walkie-talkie. And I think, oh, thank God, no, Gus. I walk up. I get in the plane. I sit down. I look up, and who's flying the plane? Gus, of course. So <laughs> took that risk into my hand. He gets me to 10,000 feet. I jump out of the plane, and I do not have a single problem. I knew it. I was like, I knew I'd be the one that doesn't screw this thing up. 10,000, 8,000, 6,000. I get to 4,000 feet. I rush across and pull my ripcord. One problem. When I reached across my body like that, I lost my aerodynamic and I started spinning around in the air like that. Now my chute opened up, thankfully, but all my late lines were tangled. But one thing popped into my mind at that moment. It was kick like a bicycle, a stationary bike from hell. Believe me, I was kicking like a bicycle. Those things unturned and I was able to land. Now, I tell that story because it isn't about the 72 things to do when you get on the wing of the plane. It isn't about the five things to do if your lines get tangled. They gave us five things. We practiced them over and over. We made them memorable so that when the pressure hit, we had a habit. And that's the key, right? We all know what to do, but when the pressure hits, can we do it? And the idea today is to maybe learn some things and do some exercises and learn some new ideas so that when the pressure hits you, you can remember it. You can do it. You can kick like a bicycle. Fair enough? Good. I like to start off and have some fun. I like to start off with some games. Uh, actually, before we do that, I just want to talk to you about where we're going today. Here's where I look at what we want to try to do when we work with companies. We think about three things, attitude, tools, and skills. Got to have all three. Right, if I was skydiving and I had a great attitude, like, woo, I can't wait to jump, but I didn't have a parachute, I'd be in trouble. Right? I could have all the tool, I could have all the attitude tools I want, but if I didn't know how to pull my parachute, put on the brakes, I'd be in trouble. Companies need all three of these. So today we're going to be talking about attitude, tools, and skills. They'll all be in your workbook. We'll work on them. And then we're going to end up talking about something that might be a little bit different called authenticity. And that's something we're going to wrap up today with, and I don't want to get too much into it now, but it really, I think, is at the core of effective sales and negotiation. But like I said, I like to, um, I'm a frustrated game show host. Um, when I was, uh, as I graduated college, you know, I even had a bucket list back then, and I wanted to be on a game show. And I got to tell you, I was phenomenal at the game show Scrabble. There used to be a game show called Scrabble. It was hosted by Chuck Woolery. Remember, remember Chuck Woolery? Yeah, back in two and two. I met Chuck Woolery. I went on this game show. I got onto it, and it was amazing. Because again, I was one of those people that I'd look at this you know, Scrabble game show on TV, and I'd like crush it. I'd be like, the answer is this. Can't you see it? It's rainbow. Oh my gosh. You know, we're all sitting at home doing this. Here's one challenge. You get on that stage, and those lights hit you, and I swear it was like faucets under my armpits. You're like, uh, I don't know. So I ended up losing in the final speed round. So I didn't make it to the finals. And ever since then, I wanted to be Chuck Woolery. And so I'm going to be Chuck Woolery today. I'm going to be a game show host. We're going to have a game show called The Dollar Bill Game. I have two wonderful contestants, and I want you to welcome them up for me right now. First of all, I have Ron Lick. Tinger. He's with Sage Communications. It's a strategic communications and PR firm representing advanced tech and government agencies. Everybody, welcome Ron. Ron, come on up. Hello. There we go, right there. And negotiating against Ron today will be Ron Wills. He is a global, he's with Global CEO Solutions. He does operational and financial re-engineering. Re Please welcome. Ron, and here's what we have today. We have Ron versus Ron in a great negotiation. And what we're going to do is we're going to negotiate. Now, we have two excellent contestants. We have a charismatic host. What else do we need for a game show? We need some money. money. Here we go. I have 10 $1 bills. We're going to ask Ron to negotiate against Ron for these 10 $1 bills. Here's the thing. Few rules. You can't split it five and five. Yeah. You can't say, tell you what, I, I'll take nine, you get one, and I'll buy you a beer later. No side deals. No side deals. No side deals. And the final thing is, if you don't get it done in 30 seconds, I take all 10 $1 bills back. I've picked Ron, and I've picked Ron. Which Ron will win the dollar bill game? Ready? Negotiate. Hey, Ron. Uh what are you doing after this event? There's some things that we'd love to get you involved with. Maybe if I had about 10 bucks, I could get things started for us. Well, I'm going to go right back to my desk and I'm start 
going to start making some cold calls. Are you good? Yeah. Good. That's yep. great news. Yeah. Oh, I can't hear. Sorry. Sorry. Nice and loud. Nice and loud. So I tell you what, what if you've got that, then you want me to go ahead and take care of this for you now, and then you can go back and, and handle those uh, calls this uh, today. Now, I, I think I got this under control here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're at 30. So I'm going to take the 10 $1 yeah. bills back. No agreement. But I do. I did know that. But I do have something for each of you. I have a copy of my book, The Power of Nice, as your consolation prize. And I appreciate you doing the game with me. Thank you very much. Very much. Now, how unfair was that? <laughs> How unfair was that? Let me ask you a question. Do you think Ron and Ron were under a little bit of pressure there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? And what happens when we get under pressure? We revert to habits. Right? Habits. And typically when we're negotiating, the typical habit is, how can I get the money? Right? And this, I've done this good. I've done this over a thousand times. Believe me. And only about... 2% of the time do people actually walk away with the money, right? So we want to think about, well, gee, like, how would a negotiator, and again, I appreciate Ron and Ron doing this. It's impossible to really, we've only had a few people come up with solutions. Let me ask you a question. How would you solve this one? And again, I didn't expect Ron and Ron to do it up here, but how would you solve this negotiation? What are some things that could have been done to be able to get that money? You could find out what's important to the other person. Now you had 30 seconds, so it's going to be tough, but you could. Hey, what's important to you? Now if I ask them what's important to you, they might say the $10 bills. So we got to be careful of that. What else might you do to be able to get that? Umar, go ahead. You know what? I've had people take the 10 bucks out of my hand, and I say, I'm sorry, that's not a deal. <laughs> I had one person rip them in half and give the other person the half, and I was like, I don't know what you're doing with that, but... What else could you have done? We've had some solutions. Can you think of anything else? Wait, go ahead. What, you, what could you have done? Offer something that you can give up. Offer something like what? Um, uh, I don't know. Right. Something that they're motivated by that isn't really going to impact your ability to succeed. So it's and you know what? It's tough. I, 